Today's sermon text will come from Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39, if you'd like to follow along. You have probably heard the proverb, blood is thicker than water. Blood is thicker than water. I've always heard that proverb since I was a child. But its meaning uh, was always explained in this way. The obligations, the loyalty, and the love that we have for our families, that is for our blood, that's more important than any other ties that we have. So the point's taken, but I still really didn't understand why those words meant what they did. <laughs> so after a Wikip little bit of Wikipedia research, and some of you may have done that before, it turns out that the first use of the proverb was in the 12th century, was in 12th century Germany at a time when shipbuilding technology was advancing uh, so much further than it had been. And people were able to make more extended voyages over the high seas than they ever had been before, which meant that families who previously had remained together in the same little towns, the same little hamlets and villages for generations and generations and generations as far back as anyone could remember. And now they find themselves able to venture out and to, to find new places because of these ships, these advancing and shipping, and they're separated by vast bodies of water. And people begin to wonder, if families are not around each other all the time like they used to be, will this absence of distance separated by vast bodies of water, will it challenge the loyalties of the family members? And the proverb is a way to put that fear to rest. No, our loyalties won't change because our shared blood is thicker than the waters that separate us. Blood is thicker than water. Family is so important. That's why we took the month of December and, and then some really to concentrate on family and how God wants our families to be built up, not just for the sake of the family, but also for the church and for the culture that we live in. But my question today, as we finish this series on family, is there anything thicker than blood? Is there anything more important to you than family? Let's listen to the words of our Lord as we seek to answer this question. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39. There Jesus says, Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be members of his household. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me just begin my comments by saying, wow, what a provocative teaching by Jesus. Far from building up the family, it seems here like Jesus is tearing it apart. I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against a mother. But is that the case? Does Jesus want to see the destruction of families? I don't think it's so much that Jesus wants to destroy families as he wants to dismantle them. He wants to take the members of each of the family members apart from each other and then unite them instead to himself. If you've read your New Testament, you'll know that this is not the only place where Jesus speaks provocatively. But as I look back at some of those other difficult teachings of Jesus, I notice something. They seem to center around the areas of our life that are deeply held and incredibly personal and valuable. For instance, there's one occasion when a rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, what good thing should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds saying, well, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. In that instance, Jesus is striking right at our wealth. And if that weren't enough, Jesus goes on to say, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And that saying makes us uncomfortable and that's why we always try to explain it away. I hear that a lot. When this verse comes up, we always try to explain away the camel going through the eye of the needle. 
Why is it that every time we hear that story, our initial gut reaction is to try to find a way to defend the rich man? Oh, well, the eye of a needle is actually a very small gate. And, and though it would be difficult for a camel to get through, it's not impossible. Stop. Right? Stop defending the rich man. Because what you're doing there is not defending the rich man. You're trying to defend yourself. Because you're not sure how rich rich is. And maybe you fall into that category. And does that mean that you're not going to make heaven? Because, well, let's be honest, you're certainly not going to sell all your things and give it to the poor, are you? The teaching is not about whether it's possible for a rich man to get into heaven or not. It's about your relationship with your money. A relationship that is deeply held and incredibly valuable to you personally. In another instance, Jesus invites a man to follow him, and the man said, I will. I'll follow you, Lord. Just get, let me go and first bury my dad, who's recently died. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. Striking right at the man's relationship with his father and even the rest of his family. Uh, again, don't try to defend this man who wants to bury his father. Instead, put yourself in his shoes, because they're your shoes. Would you leave the funeral of, of a deceased parent? Or how about your deceased spouse? A relationship that is deeply held and incredibly valuable to you personally. So what Jesus wants to teach us in no uncertain terms is, is that if we're truly going to be his disciples, there can be no relationship that can be more deeply held or more incredibly valued than our relationship with him. None. Not even close. That's why his statements seem so shocking. Because he's striking a direct blow at what is most precious to us. But even still, doesn't it seem kind of overdramatic? Can't both be true? We value our relationship with Jesus the most, but we also have these deeply held family relationships at the same time. But the reason that Jesus sh chooses such shocking language, such stark terms, is because it can be true, but you can't start there. You can't start with deeply held family relationships and then later on add Jesus into the mix. No matter what you say, you're going to let those other relationships that you started with at various times and in various ways take priority over what Christ calls you to do. No, in order to become spiritually alive to Christ, you have to first be willing to become spiritually dead to every other allegiance. Absolutely everything has to die to you before anything can begin to live in a meaningful way in Christ. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus puts it this way. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Again, it's not that Jesus literally wants you to hate your parents and your children, but there is no other way to use language to get at the seriousness and the intensity of the point that Jesus is trying to make. He, to, to demand an absolute fidelity from his disciples over absolutely everything else in creation. It's a high price that Jesus calls his disciples to pay. In fact, in verse 39, he even indicates that the price is as high as our very lives. He says, he who has lost his life for my sake. But if someone is going to require such a, a high price, then there are surely are going to offer an even higher reward, right? If that were not the case, then no one would ever take Jesus up on his offer. The cost would be too high. The reward would be too low. And every reasonable person would say, no, nah, no, thank you, Jesus. I'd rather keep my family. I'd rather keep my money. I'd rather keep my life. So, so what reward would Jesus possibly offer that would make losing everything in this world worth it? Well, he offers himself forever. One of my favorite questions is, what do you get when you follow Jesus? What do you get when you follow Jesus?
And, and I want to caution you because there are so many so-called churches out there that are offering so many wrong answers to that question. There are plenty of false preachers who will tell you that if you follow Jesus, you get health and financial blessings and prosperity. And you know what? If that were true, there might be many more people who would follow Jesus. In fact, that's really what they're counting on. More people in the pews, more dollars in the plates. There would be more people who would follow Jesus, at least until Jesus said something like this, he who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. At that point, he would lose everyone because everyone makes the same calculation saying, my daughter is worth more to me than my own health. My son is worth more to me than cars or promotion or money. Now, Jesus doesn't say that because he's, or Jesus doesn't say that because he's not trying to gain the most followers. He says it because, he says it because he's offering something that is extremely costly, but infinitely worthy. He's offering himself. The problem with many churches preaching the so-called prosperity gospel is not so much that they have overestimated what God will do for people in this world. Sometimes we think that. We think, oh, they're, they're playing it up too much. God, they're saying God's going to give them too much. No, it's not, it's not that they're overestimating what God will do for people in the world. Certainly God may, indeed, materially bless his people in this life. That's completely within the scope of possibility. The problem they have is that they, are, they woefully underestimate the eternal worth of Christ Jesus himself. That when he is seen by his people, and when he is truly seen, he is the most satisfying of all, more satisfying than the accomplishments of a thousand lifetimes, more beautiful than an endless sunset. He is, he is more pleasurable than, than any human mind could possibly fathom. The problem is that we have a tendency to value our world. Is not, the problem is not that we have a tendency to value our world too much. It's really that we don't value Christ Jesus enough. That's what Jesus is teaching here about the family. It's, it's not that we, we value our families too much. It's that we have the tendency not to value Christ enough. Everyone has to make the calculation. Is it worth it for them? What do you get in giving up your money, your family, your life? What do you get when you follow Jesus? You get Jesus. Now, all that being said, the New Testament makes it very clear that there are, are wonderful implications for our families when we do commit ourselves to follow Jesus. Ephesians chapters 5 and 6, husbands will love their wives in a new way, in a way that is self-sacrificing for her, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives will honor their husbands in order to witness to the way that the church honors Christ. Children will obey their parents out of obedience to the Lord. What you'll see when you look at a family where one or more of its members are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ is a family that has a better chance of being more loving, more meaningful, and more resilient than ever before. And the more people in that family who are committed to following Christ, the better the chance there is. Now again, I feel it necessary to point this out because there are many critics who will point to the statistics and they'll say, well, Christian families are just as likely to divorce as non-Christian families. But I'll say this, you cannot come to Jesus just because you want your, ha your family to be happy and healthy. Don't forget, this is the same Jesus who said, I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. What do you get when you follow Jesus? It's not necessarily a happy, healthy family. It's Jesus. You get Jesus. So you have to settle in your mind whether he is what you want. Whether he is all satisfying for you. Even if it comes at the cost of your family. Now that being said, I don't want us to forget that the tendency of Christ's presence in a family through one or more of its members is not to destroy but to strengthen the family yes our commitment to christ must be unrivaled the unrivaled commitment of our life that's exactly what jesus is getting at in these verses we read today but the same jesus who spoke these words also upheld marriage 
He upheld it in his teaching. He even strengthened its bond against the tendency for divorce in his own day. It's the same Jesus who blessed the little children as they came to him. Jesus is ultimately a proponent of the family, but not just any sort of family. He's a proponent of families that are built upon him. He's a proponent of families whose relationships with each other exist only because of their relationship with him, that it exists first. He's a proponent of families that are unbreakable because each of its members has an unbreakable bond with him. It's the final message I'm preaching in this series on family, but I want to leave us with this incredible thought. Every Christian belongs to a family, the family of Jesus Christ. And we belong to this family, not by the blood that courses through our veins, but by faith. When I initially titled this sermon, I thought I would end the sermon by saying that there is something thicker than blood, and it's faith, faith that binds us to Christ. And because of that faith, it also binds us to each other. So faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is an even stronger bond than our blood, our, ge- our genetic relationships, our families. And all that's true, but that's not where I wanna end today. Because there is one more thing I want us to consider. What is it that we have faith in? Jesus? Yes, of course. But specifically, what about the person and the work of Jesus? We have faith that the blood he shed on the cross was an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let me put it another way. God is a just God. He looks down from heaven and he sees the way that we have totally messed up our own families and the human family as a whole. Filled with sin, wickedness, awful things being done, he sees that. And since he is a just God, he knows that someone has to pay the penalty for that. Justice has to be done. Who should pay? Me. I'm the one that introduced sin and brokenness into my family. You. You should pay. I don't have to tell you. You know that you've done some sinful things that have been destructive to yourself and your family. But who does pay? Jesus. Where it should be my blood shed, it's his blood shed instead. And by faith in his blood, we're made clean. We're joined together as family. Nothing, nothing is thicker than blood. The blood of Christ, that is. It joins together the people of every nation, tribe, and tongue in one family, washed in the blood of Jesus. Finally, let me be very clear and honest. If there's anyone listening who is not trusted in the Lord Jesus, you are right now in extreme danger. If you depart from him, apart from him, then you will be that way forever. You'll be in real and conscious torment that the Bible calls hell. But it doesn't have to be that way. I proclaim to you today, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior, that you too are invited to be washed in his blood, embraced in his family, both now and forever. It'll happen if you honestly will say with your mouth and believe in your heart that Christ is both Lord and he is Savior, forever and ever. Amen. May this word be to the glory of God and for the joy of his people. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for the gift of your son, who, because his blood was shed on the cross, has made one family of every people, tribe, and tongue, who's brought us together as as clean and righteous and holy, not because of what we've done, but because of what he did. And we ask now that you would help us to leave this place with the joyful message that Christ is the Savior and take that into the world and proclaim it to to the lost and, and proclaim it to the hurting and proclaim it to all who will listen. Lord, open the ears of those whom you put in our path that they too may hear and believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.